I'd first like to thank Charlotte Gaw for straightening my bow tie. And Miyuki Baker for making it. <clears throat> to President Chop, Vice President Eldridge, thank you. To the administration, deans, and professors, the amazing Arboretum and Environmental Services staffs who've made our campus gorgeous, thank you. To my parents, my grandparents, my brother and sister, and my very first school teacher, who are all in the audience. <laughs> to my dear friends, the apocalyptically great class of 2012. <laughs> the last class. Finally, to your grandparents, your parents, and friends. For the next eight or nine minutes, you're entirely at my mercy. <laughs> you know, it's amazing that previous commencement speakers, and I did my research because old habits die hard. <laughs> but it's amazing that no one has thought to do a filibuster. <laughs> so, I propose the first Swarthmore commencement filibuster. <laughs> Squelch. Spinach. Sarcophagus. I can keep going indefinitely. You want to hear a joke? Why don't you want to mess with two burly 10 cent coins? I'll say it again. Why don't you want to mess with two burly 10 cent coins? because they're probably the dominant paradigms. <laughs> On a more serious note, that joke cost over $200,000. Your groans were already paid for. <laughs> Subsidizing the trees. <laughs> now who's laughing? <laughs> Friends, if the Mayan diagnosticians were right, or if Mitt Romney wins the election this November, <laughs> then the apocalypse will truly be upon us and ours will be the very last class to graduate from college. Since it is perhaps a dead institution, let's pause to think how fundamentally strange the college experience is. Dorm life, chocolates and choosing, finger painting study breaks, we once had ponies on campus, there's always a Malamute or two. Then, there's those back-breaking, soul-shriveling, mind-enfeebling, knee-shattering examinations. It's a strange dissonance, folks. Playtime and pain. It's like going to, to the most intense kindergarten ever. <laughs> and we're Swatties, so there's actually very little that isn't bizarre about our college experience. Screw your roommate, the crumb regatta, ninja grams. Swarthmore begins to sound like a school for gifted mutants. <laughs> or children whose unruly imaginations and social maladjustment have made them exceedingly dangerous. <laughs> At worst, it sounds like we're all psychotic and potentially violent. We have a much-cherished event called the pterodactyl hunt. Ponder for one moment the possibility that we are all insane. But today, as we gallivant off into the grassy green future, I'd like to talk specifically about the strangeness of commonality, sameness. Think back four years, freshman orientation. 
Many of us were relieved in our first weeks to think that now, now finally, we could meet and befriend and crush on and thence avoid and forge lifelong friendships with and marry and eventually divorce people just... <laughs> people just like us. It's a nice idea. Common practice, common taste, common politic, yeah. Of course, it's not true. The thing is, commonality gets expressed as a precondition, an already, a fact of peculiar precedence, as if we were always Swatis before we were actually Swatis. Think about the inveterate, almost exhausted notion of quirk, that which registers one as idiosyncratic, different, unlike one's context. And yet, hang on, we're all apparently quirky, right? Unlike our context, on a literal conceptual level, how can this be true? It just sounds like anarchy. <laughs> this all seems sinister, which it's not. Because we do have something in common, fundamentally, honestly, something that unites us all. Please indulge me for one second and close your eyes. Imagine a moment of perfect peace, the sunrise after that dreaded all-nighter, the calm before the coming storm, that nanosecond after the kiss. Uh, uh. For those of you who don't know, <laughs> and believe me, you're lucky, <laughs> that is the sound of the Swarthmore Firehorn. In our post-pager age of cell phones and interconnectivity, <laughs> that sound marshals the Swarthmore volunteer firefighters. It calls them to action. And that, my friends, that damn fire horn. <laughs> that sound whose phantom echoes I fully expect to wake me up at four in the morning when I'm 50 in, in some weird post-swatty, but how can you be a post-swatty? Was I ever truly a swatty bout of neurosis? <laughs> that is the sound of common experience. <laughs> it's disorienting. It's pure shock. It alters us. Becoming us, becoming a swatty, becoming, is never inert or passive or pleasant, but is instead a process of constant and tremendous upheaval. <laughs> that sound is also the sound of the future. It's something we anticipate and anticipation is the emotion of futurity. In a profound way, it's the sound of many futures, many fires, encroaching on and eclipsing the present. Boy, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds a lot like graduation. It's hard in a space as sunny and benign as our amphitheater to remember that the future is not, by definition, rosy. In Googling, quotes about the future, I found the following. Quote, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. That's, that's nonsense. That was Eleanor Roosevelt during the middle of the Great Depression. Here's the thing, class of 2012. The future does not belong to us, though we've been told many times that it does. We cannot hope or dream the future into docility. The future is fire. I have a friend who I won't call by name because she'd find it tremendously embarrassing, really mortifying. Hillary Hamilton. <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> Hillary is terrified of most things, but especially terrified of that horn. You know the tunnel between the field house and Sharples? 
You know how it echoes, really magnifies sound? Well, she runs through it, has for four years, so as not to get caught in the paralyzing echo of the future. Running through tunnels is an anticipation, a fear and deferral of the future at the expense of the present. Mel Brooks has a quote that I love. He says, quote, we should now ourselves more. Now thyself is more important than know thyself. He continues, all we do is make plans. We think that somewhere there are going to be greener pastures. It's crazy. Heaven is nothing but a grand monumental instance of the future. Listen, now is good. Now is wonderful. Folks, as we leave and go our separate ways, I urge you not to run through tunnels. After four years, we have been turned into Swatis, richly, densely, passionately, resplendently, plutoperfectly weird ass people. <laughs> Having made it thus far, after enough shock, let's try not to anticipate, not to extend ourselves too far into a future that's already insinuating itself. Let's not run, let's stroll. Thank you. <laughs>